his scepter and staff in hand, his eye moving across the land. He is the center of life, the spinner of the wheel. The prophets have come to feel that he will return again. are turning through space with a semblance of stability, in a cosmos more filled with chaos than order. In this uncertain world, we want peace, the kind that allows us to raise our children in safety and happiness, and the kind of peace that brings an end to military death and destruction. We do not want the peace of passive acceptance but a peace steeped in justice, a peace that comes after the ultimate victory of the light over the darkness. We want a leader who will be a lord of justice, a lord of peace, a king of kings, the center of the wheel of life, a visionary thinker who acts as a bridge to the transcendent. The modern world can often feel like riding on the edge of a wheel, spinning ever faster as we cling tightly against the centrifugal force threatening to toss us off into the abyss and offering us no stability around which to build our lives. The world is rapidly changing and unpredictable. Perhaps we worry about large-scale instability such as our countries changing quickly beyond all recognition, or that our city might become unlivable, overrun with broken people who cannot resist the downward pull of mass culture. Or perhaps we worry about smaller scale instability, like whether or not we will still have a job tomorrow. Everywhere we look, our natural instinct is to crawl closer to the center to find stability somewhere in our lives that can be a grounding force for us. Our lives are chaos, and we are looking for Logos. In the traditional world, people looked to their king for stability. 
A man who was more than a man, perhaps even a god or descended from gods, but certainly a man who had a direct connection to the divine. We spoke in the last episode about the solar symbolism of the king, and we will now turn our attention to the relevant polar symbolism. When we say polar, we are referring to the concept of a central point around which all else rotates, like the axis of the Earth which runs through the North and South Poles. This is the role that the traditional king fulfills. As the axis of the Earth turns on its poles, so too is the king the axis of the empire, around whom everything turns so long as he is grounded in being. All of the energy in his entire kingdom can depend on his steadiness. He is like the peaceful eye in the center of a raging hurricane. Evola opens chapter 3 with a reference to an archetype of a universal benevolent king called a Chakravartin, which is a Sanskrit word that means spinner of the wheel. Let us first discuss the wheel before we speak of its spinner. The wheel can be thought of like the Dharma wheel, which has a central hub that is the axis on which all the laws of life rotate. Evola also speaks of the wheel as representing the stream of becoming, the samsaric churning of regeneration, which the Greeks called the wheel of fate. When the Chakravartin, the universal king, organizes his lower energies and subjects them to a higher principle, he becomes known in the Vedic tradition as the Lord of the Wheel of the Law, or Dharmaraja, the Lord of Dharma, or Lord of Justice. Grounded and self-mastered, this Lord of Logos is the pivotal center point around which the entire world may turn. When the king embodies the Dharma, then the golden age of man may resume. As the wheel turns, it makes one revolution after another, returning to its original position before making another turn. But the concept of a spiral is also an interesting way of looking at the rotation around a central axis, and we can see this best represented by a helix, where each rotation traverses not a flat circle, but a helical one, finding its relative starting point again, but at a higher or lower level. In yogic anatomy, one may be familiar with the diagram of the person seated in a lotus position with all the chakras aligned along the spine and the dual energy currents, one solar and one lunar, traveling up the spine in a serpentine helical pattern towards the thousand-petaled lotus at the crown chakra, representing spiritual awakening. In the previous episode, we spoke about why it was essential for the traditional king to be a spiritually awakened man. The king needs to be the bridge to the transcendent world, so it is important that he has been able to master himself. A man who is unable to do this cannot be the stable axis that is needed, cannot be the link between the heavens and the earth, of which the polar axis is a symbol. This is a prerequisite for a Golden Age state, and so the king must first have a stable inner axis around which his own energies can turn in an upward spiral towards the divine. In creating this in himself, he can create it for the world. We may also consider the Sanskrit words Dukkha and Sukha, which are terms used in Vedic spiritual traditions. Dukkha is commonly translated to mean suffering or dissatisfaction as it relates to mundane life, but its literal translation is actually in reference to an axle hole of a wheel that is off its center, causing a very bumpy and uncomfortable ride. Sukha, on the other hand, is translated to mean happiness and ease, but originally referred to a well-placed center axle hole. 
we experience dukkha or suffering in this world because we tend to approach the world of becoming, a world which is in a constant state of change, with expectations of permanence, which leads to disappointment and unhappiness. But the king, as the well-placed center, can lead those around him to sukha, to happiness, in part because he is a bridge to the world of being, and the stability he provides as the axle of the wheel allows his subjects to have a reliable order around which to orient their lives. Later in the chapter, Evola writes, According to Confucius, a man destined to be a ruler, the virtuous, unlike ordinary men, rests in rectitude and is stable and unperturbed. The men of affairs enjoy life, but the virtuous prolongs it. Hence, that great calm that conveys the feeling of an irresistible superiority and terrifies and disarms the adversary without a fight. This greatness immediately evokes the feeling of a transcendent force that is already mastered and ready to spring forward, or the marvelous and yet frightful sense of the Newman. This is the spiritual might that supersedes physical might and is the basis of the king's gravitas. This is what provides weight to his authority and leadership, as well as stability. Evola speaks of several polar symbols related to kingship. The first is the scepter, still considered a symbol of regality in the modern age, though most may not know why. The scepter is a physical representation of an axis, a symbol of his power, but a power he only has because he is that axis. When the king possesses the quality of immutability, of stability, then he spins the wheel, or rather, it spins around him. This is the nature of the Chakravartin. Another symbol is the throne, an elevated seat. Evola says that in some mystery initiatic traditions, there is a ritual that involves sitting still on a throne, and that this ritual seems to have been significant, as this ritual enthronement appears to have been synonymous with initiation itself. The nature produced in a man by initiation is comparable to the nature that the traditional king is said to have had. The image of a king sitting on his throne evokes an image of the Buddha, himself born to a royal family, seated in meditation, his mind calm, around which turns the chaos of the outer world. The king likewise should be a master of himself, as a mere starting point from which all other possibilities arise. Initiatory orders assume this total command of the mind as the prerequisite state before any progress can be made on the path, or even before a new initiate can begin the journey. The other symbols Evola mentions are the ziggurat or the mandala, both representing the upward spiral journey towards a spiritual center, which fits neatly with the image of the helix and which Evola says are the ideal architectural structures for the royal palace of a Chakravartin, as they give expression to the cosmic order, both in its hierarchy and also the dependence on the unmoved central point. From an initiatic perspective, the forms dramatize the spiritual ascent of the initiate from the profane world to the sacred, and he refers to an initiation ritual in which he who reaches the center is crowned king, symbolizing that he has lifted himself above the forces of the inferior world, just as the traditional king would have been expected to do. The Dharma Raja is perhaps the highest form of the Chakravartin. Historically, Chakravartin has more of a secular meaning, but the Dharma Raja goes beyond that, embodying spiritual concepts of peace and justice. Evola says, Obviously this is not the profane and social peace pursued by a political government, a kind of peace that is, 
at most an external consequence, but rather an inner and positive peace, which should not be divorced from the triumphal element. This peace does not convey the notion of cessation, but rather that of the highest degree of perfection of a pure, inner, and withdrawn activity. It is a calm that reveals the supernatural. Evola makes a reference to the title of Imperator Pacificus, a prince of peace, one who must not only embody a spiritual unity and preserve peace, but also one who is himself a fountain of peace by which law and justice of a divine sort are preserved and restored among imperfect men. Evola draws the fundamental link between peace and justice and notes that these terms do not have a secular meaning. Referring back to the Dharma Raja, he points out that Dharma does not just mean justice, but also the proper nature of, meaning a metaphysical, hierarchical, and upwardly oriented organization of all life, with everything fulfilling its proper form and function according to its nature or according to justice and truth. This idea is echoed in Plato's Republic, where the idea of a just city ruled by a just government would have each person and thing fulfilling a specific and proper natural role in a hierarchy. The king of justice, therefore, must have a superior and supernatural knowledge of the primordial laws that govern human nature. In the Republic, it was written that the philosopher king would be the ideal ruler. And for Plato, this did not just mean a learned thinking man, but one who had the wisdom and knowledge of that which is, meaning the true metaphysical world. This concept of a king as being the person who ensures that the world around him is well-ordered can even be traced back to a Proto-Indo-European word, Hreg, which in its root form meant to straighten or set right in the sense of justice. This root word is the ancient and fairly direct ancestor of words meaning king, law, royal, reign, and to rule. It is in fact the ancestor of the Sanskrit word raja, as in dharma raja. What exactly is this idea of peace that so many invoke, yet so few actually know? Not only outward peace in the world, for it is indeed a rare thing, but also inner peace, the kind that comes from a focused and inspired life, for it is a difficult state to achieve. When we go against our fundamental nature, when we rebel against the universal cosmic order, we will never feel as if we have found a grounding center. But when we live in accordance with our true essence, we gather and consolidate otherwise disparate energies into our task of awakening. This is why the ultimate peace is not the peace found in surrender, but rather that transcendent peace achieved after the supreme victory of the Divine brought down to Earth, establishing the reign of eternal cosmic law in the world of men, ushering in a new golden age. This is the triumphal element. It is the luminous and resplendent peace found in transcendent perfection, knowing that glorious justice has aligned our world with the metaphysical dimension, and that everything is in its proper organic order, as above, so below. We long for a leader who is visionary, who unifies the past with the future, who is a philosopher in the true sense, shining the light of transcendent knowledge upon all who witnessed his state of being. For what would our world be like if, in the words of Plato, that both the spirit and power of philosophers and political greatness and wisdom met in one supreme King of Kings. Until that day comes, we will never be free of the evil that men do, 
and we will never see the heights to which we could soar. Preservation and maintenance of the natural cosmic order in the material realm was the primary function of the traditional king in the Golden Age, but our leaders have long ago failed in this forgotten mission, leaving the world spinning into meaningless nihilism and near total disconnect from the divine. Our wheel has no axle. One might be reminded of the famous line from the poem The Second Coming by Yeats. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. But in the absence of a true king to anchor the wheel, we must hold our own centers by being masters unto ourselves, cultivating our own inner light until such a day when the next king of kings might emerge. Whether that happens in our lifetimes is secondary. What is essential is how we live our lives, how we express who we are, and how these perennial truths provide a deeper understanding of human history and the glorious tradition that echoes through the ancient world.